Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today we will talk about strong forces, the forces which are inside the nucleus of the atom, um, and they hold basically the nucleus together. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. Um, the, uh, the course presented there, uh, well, it's a course, which means there is a menu, there is a sequence of lectures which logically follow uh, one from another, and I do suggest you to basically take the whole course on the website rather than just individual lectures which you can find on YouTube or somewhere else. Um, now, the website contains also a prerequisite course called Math for Teens. Um, uh, knowledge of mathematics is mandatory to study physics. So I do suggest you to at least get acquainted with this course as well. Well, maybe you know it, the mess, so everything is fine then. Um, there are, um, for each lecture, there are notes, which basically are arranged like a textbook. For each lecture, there is a corresponding like chapter, if you wish, of the textbook. Um, the website is totally free. There are no advertisement no financial strings attached, even signing on is not necessary. I mean, you can do it, but it's not necessary. Well, okay, that's it. Let's get to strong forces. Now, what I'm, uh, what I'm supposed to talk about today is, um, it's a contemporary view, and uh, I have simplified it in many um, aspects. I avoid completely all the uh, calculational part of it. So I'm talking about like a general understanding of what strong forces actually are and how they act inside the nucleus with certain details, obviously, but not the nitty-gritty of quantum theory. Absolutely not. It's beyond the uh, level of this course. So, um, and again, there are certain things which are like theories. Mm, some of them are not necessarily firmly confirmed by experiment. Uh, but nevertheless, again, it's introduction into a theory of strong forces. It's not really a complete explanation of how everything is working. So, let's start from um, the concept which we used to deal with before is the concept of field. And examples are gravitational field and electromagnetic field. Now, what's important about the field as we know it? Well, number one, we need something which we call a charge, right? Well, the charge is the word which we have borrowed from electromagnetic field, electric charge, basically positive or negative. In the world of gravitation, the equivalent of the charge is mass. But we will use, <coughs> but we will use the word charge equally applicable to electromagnetic field as basically their charge and in the gravitational field, which basically is something which we use to, to call mass, but we will use the word charge generally for the field. So if there is a field, it means somebody should produce this field. And what exactly produces the field? A charge. Okay, so field needs the charge. Also what field needs? Field needs something which acts and um, the force basically. The, 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 what is the field? Field is something where we feel the force of something. Well, the, feels th the force of this charge, for example. So if you are a, let's say, positive charge, and there is another positive charge, you feel repelling force, right? Now, here we have, let's talk about electromagnetic field. Here we have duality between the wave theory and corpuscular theory. And we have basically agreed that electromagnetic field has basically dual properties. And there is something which we called photon, if you remember. Photon is something which 
is basically a, a carrier of the energy and you can say that exchange of photons which basically means exchange of quantum of quantum of, air, of energy is what makes actually the force so if there is a field there is a charge and there is a fourth force which is supposed to be connected to something which basically activate that force it's it's a carrier if you wish of energy of the field so the photon is a carrier of the energy of electromagnetic field now speaking about gravitational field well there is a theory that there is something which is called graviton and again there are some experiments which were suggesting that they exist but in any case as a theory we do kind of accept or we don't find that this is completely outrageous that there is something which is called graviton graviton which is a, again a quantum of energy of gravitational field which basically carries this energy and manifests existence of these manifest as a force now why do I talk about this because strong nuclear force is something which we definitely observe let's talk about the nucleus nucleus contains protons and neutrons protons are positively charged which means they all repel each other we need force which keeps them together it's not gravitational force because it's much weaker than even electromagnetic field I mean like millions of times weaker uh, so there is another force so this is called a strong force which people basically have to have I mean I'm not really saying we observe it but the manifestation of existence of this force is that our well universe exists and the atoms exist and the nucleus is not really breaking apart because of repelling electric electric forces now if there is a force it means there is a force field because it's not really acting like pushing each other no it's on a slight distance from each other right so if there is a force there is a field if there is a field there is a charge and there is a carrier okay so we have come to a conclusion that there is something which is called a, a strong nuclear uh, force field that it needs a source of this field something which is called basically a charge and we need uh, carriers agents which carry the energy of the strong nuclear force from one participating particle to another okay so that's kind of a logical explanation of what will be next because the next will be basically an explanation what is the charge and what are the carriers of these charges carriers of energy of these charges in the strong nuclear force field now it, I'm not talking about why I'm talking about how so I will explain how people are how physicists are actually thinking about what this particular force field is and what are the, the, the carriers etc I cannot answer the question why it exists this way I, I, I don't know why uh, two positive uh, electric positive uh, protons are repelling each other or positive and negative are attracting to each other but I can explain what exactly is happening so the same thing was this nuclear force field let's not talk about why it exists and, and basically some kind of a reasoning or maybe axiomatic der derivation from something else well it exists we witness to this we experiment with this and there is a theory of what exactly are the charges which produce this field and what exactly are particles which carry the energy of this field quantum of energy of these fields so that's what i'm going to talk about 
not why, but exactly how it's done, according to contemporary view. And it was different like 50 years ago when I was in, in high school. I was not really um, uh, learning anything like that because it did not exist. I mean, the whole revolution about this started in mid-60s of last century, so it's about 70 years ago or whatever, 60 years ago. Okay, so charges and particles that carry the energy of strong nuclear force field. Okay. Now, first of all, we know about quarks. We did mention that protons and neutrons and some other um, complex particles contains quarks. Now, there are different quarks. I did mention that something like up quark, down quark, top quark, bottom quark, strange quark, and then something else, I don't remember. So there are six, I think, types of quarks and corresponding anti-quarks. Now, since quarks are inside the proton and neutron and some other particles, like mesons, for instance, they have to be kept together. And this is the strong force, basically. Something which maintains the integrity of protons and, neut and neutrons and some other complex particles. That's a strong force. Then there is another manifestation of that strong force. How these particles are held together, proton and proton, or neutron and neutron, or proton and neutron. How it's hold, how, how, how these uh, strong forces hold particles together. So it's two different questions. Number one, how quarks are held together to form a, um, a heavy particle inside the nuclear nucleus. It's called nucleon, by the way. The general term about proton and neutron is nucleon because they are in the nucleus. So how nucleon is held together as one particle. And the second, um, how different particles of a nucleus, different nucleons, are held together to form a nucleus. So these two things we will consider separately. So first of all, let's talk about strong forces inside a nucleon, inside a proton or a neutron. Okay. Now, we have um, talked about the theory, and again, I'm not talking about why, I'm just talking about how it's basically done according to contemporary review. So, proton. Proton, basically, it's a combination of three quarks. Up quarks, up quarks, and down quarks. Each one of them has, now, up quark has plus two-third uh, electric uh, charge and down has minus one-third. So two-third plus two-third is four-third minus one-third. The charge will be one. So that's, what, that's basically what it is. It's one minimal u unit of charge, same as electron has only one but minus one. Proton has plus one. Now, the neutron has one up and two downs. So it's plus two-thirds, minus one-third, minus one-third. It's zero, so neutron is neutral, electrically neutral. Okay, so now, the next thing, <coughs> speaking about charges, and again, I'm not talking about why, I'm talking about how it's basically, uh, how it's viewed. Now, according to contemporary theory, there are not two, like in electric uh, field um, charges, positive and negative. Not one type of charge, like in gravitational field. Mass is always positive. But three. So this is a theory which was suggested again in the middle of uh, 1960s. And um, according to this theory, 
there are three different types of charges. Combined together, they make it neutral. Same as positive and negative together in equal proportions will give you zero charge. Like a neutron, for instance, positive and negative gives you zero. Same thing in case of strong forces. But there are three different types. Again, not one like gravitation, not two like electromagnetic, but three. Three different charges make up basically a strong field. Um, now, we have to call these charges somehow, right? Now, in, uh, in the world of electricity, we call it positive and negative. Now, why do we call it this way? Are they really like negative numbers and positive numbers? No, but we can measure these uh, electric forces, right? With some clever devices. And the way how we measure it, we basically use some kind of a unit of charge and we convert the charge into a unit. And it happens to be that the positive charge we call positive because we convert it into a positive real number. And negative charge we convert into negative real number. That's how our devices were basically done. Now, we use basically these um, uh, types of charges in electromagnetic field. Uh, how it is convenient basically to operate with these. Now, we have three for strong force. So we have to somehow name them to conveniently manipulate with them. And um, what's interesting is the computer technology um, related to colors is built on RGB principle, red, green, and, and blue. The combination of red, green, and blue in equal proportions gives you uh, basically no color at all either zero or uh, zero for for white and and uh, uh, and uh, well actually i don't want to call it zero but anyway if you combine them together in equal proportion you will have the white color right well also you can combine them in any other proportion and get any other color but that's besides the point in equal proportion r g and b gives you white and the absence of r g b gives you black obviously uh, now, if you take an opposite to these, if you take, for instance, opposite to R, so what is opposite? Opposite is something which added to real gives you, uh, let's say, white. So what's opposite to R? Well, obviously G to B, right? Since G and B and R, blue, green, and R gives you white, it means that blue and green is opposite to R and similarly opposite to green is what B plus R and opposite to blue is R plus G so what are these colors um, this is magenta I think uh, this is green and blue is cyan, right? And this is what? RNG yellow. So opposite to R to red is cyan, opposite to green is magenta, opposite to blue is yellow. All right, now, so we know this from the colors. And considering that we have this arithmetic of colors, people have decided to call three different types of strong nuclear field charges colors red, green and blue and then there are quarks and antiquarks antiquarks have anticolors which means cyan, magenta and yellow so that's basically the names they have nothing to do with visible light and its colors as we perceive it Everything is happening inside the nucleus, but we call them this way because it's convenient to do arithmetic, same way as we call 
electric charge is positive and negative, not because they are real numbers, positive and negative, but because it's convenient to operate with them. So, these are three uh, colors which basically are names for three different types of charges. So, I hope it doesn't really sound strange that we call a charge red or green or blue. That's the name of it. We call positive and negative for el electricity and we call red, uh, green and blue for strong forces. All right. Now, what's interesting is that to maintain um, neutrality of the color, let's use the color um, uh, analogy, to maintain neutrality of the color we need three colors together combined in the same kind of quantity, if you wish. But there is no question about quantity right now because we're talking about quarks. That's the smallest thing, so that's the smallest amount of quantity, and it's the same quantity no matter what quark we take. So if you take one particular quark, it has certain charge. It might be either red or green or blue. But we need three quarks to maintain stability. Now, what does it mean maintain stability? Look at, for instance, atom of uh, hydrogen. It has positive proton, one proton, and one negative neutron. They are together. They hold together, or they hold on together. If you take a separate electron, it will go and go, and it will look for wherever the positive charge is to stick to it. So it's kind of active until it gets the pair. So same thing here. If you would like stability, neutrality, and by the way, you have to observe the particle, right? So if you would like it to be observed, it should be somehow stable, so you can see this in some kind of a device, or have a trace of it in some kind of device. So we need three colors. So we need three charges, three colors, three quarks. So these three quarks will have to have different colors to maintain neutrality of proton or uh, a neutron. Now, they can be different. It can be R, G, B, it can be G, B, R, or R, B, G, or whatever. As long as there are three different colors. So three different colors means three different charge types of three different um, quarks which make up a particle inside a nucleus, a nucleon, a proton or neutron. That's what's needed. Okay, so we have three charges. That's good. Now, um, there are some other, by the way, particles like mesons, for instance, meson, which are a combination of two quarks. But again, we need neutrality, which means it can be something R and uh, let's say are uh, opposite, which is like red and cyan, or it can be blue and whatever, is yellow or something. <coughs> and that can be different uh, quarks. For instance, this can be U, and uh, this can be anti-quark, uh, D, lowercase, up quark and anti-down quark, which should have anti-color to this one. So the combination of these two colors gives you neutrality, and the combination of quark and anti-quark gives you meson. Right? So, <coughs> these are not parts of the nucleus, they're just flying somewhere. Primarily they were uh, discovered in cosmic radiation. And obviously we can artificially produce in some smart devices like cyclotrons, whatever. Okay, so we have come to understanding of what exactly charges which produce the strong nuclear field are. 
Okay, <coughs> so charges are fine, but now we need agents which basically deliver these charges, like photons for electromagnetic field or graviton for gravitational field. We need some agents which deliver the force which maintain the glue between three different quarks to make um, a proton or a neutron. Okay, so we have charges, now we need agents, we need particles which deliver the energy of these fields. <coughs> okay, and this is a particle which is called gluon and obviously it's related to glue which glues together different quarks <coughs> okay so what's interesting about gluon well the way how it's explained is gluon carries it's not a quark it's a completely different particle. So quark has one single charge, which is either red or green or blue. I mean, that's the names, which we, antiquarks have cyan, uh, magenta, and yellow, for instance. Now, the gluon has two colors. It has two charges together. It's a theory. Again, I'm not sure how much experimentally it was really confirmed, but it's a theory and it gives the right results of experiment as far as we can predict certain things and then these things happen, which means our prediction is based on the theory which seems to be right at the moment. So, at the moment we are thinking about particles um, which are for strong field equivalent to, let's say, photon for electromagnetic field. It's the particle which carries a quantum of energy. We call it gluon, and we are saying that, and this is the difference, photon doesn't carry electric charge within itself, but gluon does. But what's interesting is it carries two different charges at the same time. Don't ask me why. I'm just telling how we view this thing. So, it carries the color, some color, and some anti-color, let's say blue or something. Okay? So the combination of these two colors is inside this gluon. And then, and this is again similar to photon, when two different charged um, particles exchange photons to basically that's how the energy is transferred and the force is manifested same thing here now this is a, a particle which quarks exchange between themselves and that's what establishes the force which holds them together now let's talk about how it's done as far as mechanism of exchanging gluons. Let's say quark quark which has a colored green um, emits a gluon which has a combination of two colors G and R anti and anti R. So we are talking about gluon as having always two different types of charges. Some charge from the main colors and another uh, charge from anti color, anti charge. So if this is green, this is cyan. Okay? So what happens? Well, what happens is the following.
with this quark there is an arithmetic that's the original charge, right? green now we emit this gluon, which means we subtract it so we subtract G and we subtract R uh, anti R which is equal to quark well G minus G is cancelled, what's minus R? it's a negation of cyan, which is red right? negation of anti-red is red so what happens is the G quark is converted into R quark so the charge is um, transformed from green to red now obviously this guy, this gluon should be consumed by another quark now there is a quark G in the proton or a neutron so there must be quark R and another quark blue, right? So let's talk about the quark R. Now this quark consumes this gluon. What happens? Well, it means that we have a new quark. I mean the same quark but with different charges. R plus G plus anti R which is equal to obviously it would be equal to G because R and anti R would cancel each other will give you white color basically which means no color and gives you G so this convert to from from red to green so what happens when gluon of this type is exchanged between green and R green converts into R, R converts into green, so they exchange colors and this exchange of the colors actually is a manifestation of the force between these two gluons, uh, two quarks using the exchange of gluons and what happens and contemporary understanding of this mechanism is that these quarks inside the proton or any other particle like meson for instance they are exchanging these gluons like crazy all the time so the colors are always shifting with always exchange of colors red to green, green to, to, to red blue to green, green to blue and this exchange basically holds the um, nucleon or any other particle which, which consists of quarks uh, together well that's as much as I can say basically about what's inside the nucleon, inside the proton or a neutron and how the three quarks are actually held together using this exchange of gluons constant with a huge speed obviously well that's what it is now the last thing which I wanted to talk about is how different protons and neutrons are held together inside the nucleus and again as I was saying it's a result of the same exchange of, of, of gluons but there is a twist in this because now we are going outside of the boundary of one particular nucleon outside of proton or outside of neutron and because we have to have a force between two different uh, nucleons like proton to proton or neutron to proton how is that done? okay now its mechanism is called residual strong force it's not exactly the same as this one but again I will just give you an explanation how physicists understand it right now um, and again there are some uh, indirect confirmation of this experimentally but anyway here is what happens <coughs> let's consider we have two particles one particle is called proton and another is called neutron so index is particle number one is proton another is neutron so what happens 
Now, let's say proton. It contains uh, up, up, and down quarks, right? <coughs> and now the quarks inside the proton are exchanging uh, the gluons like crazy all the time. Now, what happens is, for some reason, and again, don't ask me why, this proton emits a pair of down and anti-down quarks. Now, since it's down and anti-down, it doesn't really change the electric component, it's still positive. So everything seems to be more or less intact. Why it happens, again, as I told, I don't answer the questions why. But let's consider it does happen. Now, when it happens, it, it emits these quarks. But again, the quarks are exchanging, um, uh, exchanging gluons all the time. So the colors are changing, so there is always some kind of a very transitive uh, environment. And what happens is that this D is substitutes one of these quarks, and this one is getting released. So, it, so instead of P1, we have U, D, and D quark plus u plus d but now this is a configuration not of a proton this is a configuration of neutron so the proton becomes neutron the first it's still the index is one you see so that's what happens and this together is a combination of a quark and anti-quark and it's called pi meson or pion. Now, this thing goes to this one, N2. Now, its combination is up, down, and down, since it's a neutron, right? Now, plus U, D, what happens? Well, the same thing happens, basically. U replaces D. D goes out, so it's N2, U, U, and D, plus D plus D, entity. And they somehow annihilate each other, since it's two different, uh, so, so it's the same quark and anti-quark. So they annihilate each other. And what happens after this? Our first particle, which used to be um, proton, becomes neutron. And this, as you see, I put N2, but now it's actually P2, right? It's a proton because it's up, up and down. And the neutron becomes proton. So these proton and neutron, this and this, basically exchange their type. This becomes N1 and this becomes P2. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's kind of a wonderful thing. Okay, so that's what actually, this conversion, w inside the uh, nucleon we exchange colors and that's what holds together. Here we exchange type between protons and neutrons. Proton becomes neutron, neutron becomes proton. Well, and that's establishing this conversion, this transitive movement is establishing this link between them and that's what holds them together. It's called the residual strong force. Okay, and now as a consequence of this you see why in the um, nucleus the number of protons and neutrons, well at least in light elements it's the same basically because they're always converging into one, one into another. In the heavier um, elements, neutrons, the number of neutrons exceeds number of protons. So protons must be exchanging with somebody always, because that's what holds the protons from uh, repelling each other. 
So that's why we have a number of neutrons at least as much or greater than the number of protons. Neutrons do not repel each other, but protons do. So protons need this force to be held together. Neutrons do not. So in some cases, protons, protons exchange their color with some other neutron, but not necessarily all neutrons have this connection. Or maybe they have, you know, once proton exchanges with this neutron and then other times with that neutron and back or something. I don't know. That's it. That's all I wanted to talk about strong nuclear forces. It's a lot, and I suggest you to read the notes for this particular lecture. You go to unisor.com. It's a physics 14 course. Next uh, topic is um, atoms and then elementary particles, and this lecture is about one of the elementary particles art, uh, um, chapters. That's it. Thank you very much, and good luck. <laughs>